Uh, welcome to our conversation. Today I have with me the Director of Student Accounts, Susan Kerwin. Welcome to our show. Thank you. So, Happy to be here, Brian. Thank you for coming. So tell us more about Student Accounts. Okay, let me give you a little bit of background on me. Mm -hmm. I've worked for um, the SUNY system for 29 years. Mm -hmm. um, I started in um, SUNY system administration in the Albany area. I was an auditor for the construction fund and also for SUNY at campuses. And um, then I went into the controller's office at SUNY and worked with the financial statement group. And after that, I left and became uh, worked on a campus. I worked at SUNY Cobble Skill, which at the time was a two-year school and now is a um, technology school. Um, they, um, I was there for for two years and I was a revenue accountant. Mm -hmm. And then after that I left to go to SUNY Potsdam, which is up in the North Country. I spent 19 years there, first as Director of Procurement and then as Director of Student Accounts. And um, and I came here on August 27th on move-in day. <laughs> and I am the Director of Student Accounts. And Student Accounts, um, I, I, I often joke, like, I told, like you heard earlier, that I work retail at the college yeah. Yeah. because um, basically we're customer service more than anything else. And, our main focus is the billing and collections of student um, mm -hmm. charges and tuition and fees. Mm -hmm. um, we also work with cash collection sites, and, and those are places on campus like the Anderson Center or Athletics, um, and we collect their funds also, telecom, parking services, and we make sure that those are distributed to the appropriate accounts. Um, and also work heavily with financial aid to disperse all the financial aid funds that come in. So that's kind of our main mm -hmm. mission and goal. Um, there's a lot of things about student accounts that students don't know about until they have problems. And one of the things that we'd like to work on is advocacy and, and just having students get more involved from the beginning rather than when it's stressful for them. And that's we we see a lot of stressed students and, and yeah. so we, and we try to help them and work with them. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, when you just mentioned student accounts, when somebody gets that email, <laughs> yes, they do. it's like, oh my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know. Um, something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, something's wrong. You know, that fear comes from, you know, often a lack of preparation, lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, um, in your experience, you know, what are some methods and what are some ways that students can be more prepared yeah. so they're not so scared? I think the most important thing is that the student really needs to take responsibility for the financial part of their education. Oftentimes I hear from parents and, and students that, you know, my biggest concern is my academics and they don't realize that the financial component of it is really important. You need to know how much it costs to go here. You need to know how much um, money you're taking in loans or in um, aid and what your scholarships are and those kind of things. And it, it's easy to put it at the bottom of your to-do list, but it's important to do that. So there's a lot of resources. Um, the orientation process here gives you a lot of information in a little bit of time, and that becomes overwhelming. So one of the things I say with, you know, I, I talk to freshmen about is, you know, after you leave here for orientation, Put aside some time and go through the materials that you've been given. Go out on the website and understand when is your bill coming and when is it due. Go in and set up your authorized payers. Learn what you need to do. Um, make, call us if you have a question. But when you show up the first day of classes, it's harder because everybody's there, and so you don't. You might not get the individual attention that you can get by making a phone call the second week of August or the second week of December or January, depending on when your admission is. So really, taking that responsibility is is important. Sharing in the experience and understanding that ultimately, if your bill's not paid, I mean, it's a service. When you go to Amazon and you buy something, they won't let you, they won't send it to you until you pay for it. Mm -hmm. And very the same true. thing happens with your education, it has to be paid for. And we're very reasonable in mm -hmm. terms of payment plans and billing dates. I mean, your bills, your first bill is not due until September 5th for the fall mm -hmm. and February 5th for the spring and you've already started classes. Yeah. Holds don't go on until the sixth week of classes. So we give you six weeks to really figure everything out before a hole goes on. But what's important, something that, you know, we already talked about is mm -hmm. we're a New York State agency. I mean, we're, our, our policies are dictated by SUNY but also by the state of New York. Mm -hmm. Taxpayers fund a good portion of, of the things, the, the, the tuition and fees the tuition part of it and the fees are part of it, but taxpayers' money funds us. That's mm -hmm. not all what we mm -hmm. what we use to do what we do here and, and educate mm -hmm. students. So, so understanding that we have a responsibility to those people. Yeah, and if you pay taxes in New York, you want yeah. to make sure that, that that things are done the way they should be. Yeah. So, you know, you do have to pay for it, and, and students can choose to pay their bill at the end of the semester. But when you do that, there's mm -hmm. consequences. Yeah, you can't register with everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, you could end up at collections mm -hmm. and 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 pay. A, 
way too many interest and penalty fees that yeah. you don't need to pay. That's very true. Yeah, and I've been, you know, as a student, been guilty of just leaving everything to my parents, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, Cause, it's easy. You know, yeah, because often you're just like, you know, here, mm -hmm. mom, dad, you know. So again, you said that students have to be more involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a parent of four, I believe. Um, yeah, I have four children. <laughs> you've uh, you've definitely, and they've all went to mm -hmm. school. They um, have, yep. They all went to New York State. One mm -hmm. went to Cornell, one went to Fredonia, one went to SUNY Potsdam, and the other one went to SUNY mm -hmm. Environmental Science and Forestry. So mm -hmm. we've been through the system. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and some of them had more scholarships than others, and some of them, I mean, I, payment plans were the only thing that could get, we had two kids in college at the same time, mm -hmm. three out of four years, they were both in school. So, you know, I, I get it, too. When I have conversations with parents, I get it. Yeah, yeah. And I get my, and I've, and I've made my students responsible because of the job I have. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's important for yeah. you to buy into what, what's going on. And I understand why parents want to do that. They don't want you to worry about that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, mm -hmm. either. But it's hard when you're here, and your mm -hmm. parents aren't, you know, aren't here to help you and you don't know what's going on and mm -hmm. it, it's really important to communicate with your family too. Mm -hmm. That's something that I find doesn't happen on the financial side. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be telling them about the professor that you love mm -hmm. or the class that you don't like and you really think you want to SU, that, you know, you want to put that class on pass fail or drop that class. But you don't talk about, oh, you know, the, the bill is due and, oh, or am I, or did you set up a payment plan or there's a hold on my account, why did that happen? You, you know, oftentimes a student will come to us first mm -hmm. and not even call their parent first oh, wow. <laughs> and they don't even understand why the bill's not paid yet so mm -hmm. so we really we talk a lot with parents who call us and say it's important to communicate with your student very true, very true. Yeah. now you um you know again finances is really important i think yeah. often students look at you know the education portion which is important but obviously like amazon you have to pay for it now one of the major barriers for you know uh people getting into school mm -hmm. is financial um, is there anything, any advice you'll give parents in terms of planning, in terms of um, getting ready for school? Well, I think there's two schools of thought. The first one is that you save and save and save when the child is born and then you have all this cash. Um, in one sense, that's good because you have it. And there's some families that just can't do that. The other thing is when you have all that money in the bank and you do a FAFSA, if you're a domestic student, mm -hmm. they use that against you because they, they think that you have enough funds and so mm -hmm. your expect, expected family contribution actually goes up. Mm -hmm. um, so what's really important is um, to understand how much it really costs and that if you decide on a meal plan and then your student goes and decides to change that meal plan the first week, what that does to the bill, um, a single versus a double, I mean, little things like that. Maybe there's students that only want to take 12 credits or go to part-time to nine and then it ends up taking them mm -hmm. another year to get out. I mean, you're paying for a full year again. So, um, you know, students can take 12 to 15 credits. I mean. Full time is 12, but 15 might make sense. So the cost of what, what the difference in, because if you take 12 credits and 15, it's the same price once you're full time. You don't yeah. pay more. Yeah. So a lot of those kind of conversations are important to have. The other thing is um, understanding where the funds come from and, and filling out the FAFSA in a reasonable amount of time to be eligible for aid. I think people are very surprised mm -hmm. when they go to uh, the college visit we, as we just passed through the admission center and saw all the people in, in the admission center where, and all of those people, they, a lot of them probably don't know how much it's really going to cost to come here. Yeah. They're really concerned about the programs and all those other things, but they don't, they don't get to that. And then the bill comes in, in yeah. August and they say, how am I going to pay for this? Mm -hmm. Or, wow, I didn't, with the fees yeah. and, and the courses that they take might add a course fee on, and yeah. before you know it, you know, that the money you thought you were spending is going to be more. So, so I would suggest that doing your homework yeah. and, and, and having conversations with financial aid counselors, even if you don't choose to, mm -hmm. to take loans mm -hmm. or you're not eligible for grants. That's very true. Yeah, I mean, I look at my bill and I see just the line of, you know, technology <laughs> fee, printer fee, a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Now, you also do speaking engagements. I do. Um, I so, do. yeah, can you talk more about yeah. that? Yeah, um, I am the secretary of the SUNY Bursar's um, committee, so that represents all of the um, comprehensive and university centers, so there's 30 campuses in SUNY, and we meet four times a year, and I'm the secretary of that group. I also am a regional director on the NYSOBA board. Um, NYSOBA is an organization for the New York State Bursars and business um, administrators, and at NYSOBA I teach a course, well it's just, it's a pre presentation mm -hmm. um, called Bursar Fundamentals. So I talk with new um, new staff and also people that have moved into a directorship role like mine about what they need to know. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we cover topics as, as much as like what are the regulations and what are things you have to do mm -hmm. and where are your resources to, how to manage staff and, mm -hmm. and how to think about strategic planning and, and thinking about um, 
putting people in the right places based on, on their work ethic and, and their and their um, and their abilities and their personalities versus mm -hmm. other things. So so um, that class uh, that that presentation I do every June when the conference meets. I've also um, done national presentations. When I was at SUNY Potsdam, um, we used a different platform for e-commerce billing than we do here. And their user group, um, I would talk about refunding solutions and, uh -huh. and different ways to manage your refunding population, especially in, in a place where the staff is smaller and you've had cuts and, and, um, and doing third party type situations. So those are the kind of things that I've done. I also um, do some customer service training every now and then, uh -huh. um, more locally on, on with, with um, cash collection sites. Okay. that are on campus and, and have conversations with them about how to manage and, and deal with customers and how to mm -hmm. use their systems to, uh, mm -hmm. to make them more efficient and effective in what they do. Okay. So. so yeah, it's basically, you know, financial literacy is sort of what you do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And on, on the professional sense, your conferences, you're teaching people, you know, how to manage finance as well. Sure. And, you know, translating that into students, I think a lot of students are not financially literate. They're not. You know, it's in a sense of street smarts, of course, we get taught, you know, business ideas and theories. Uh, but, you know, would you think that, you know, getting more programs, perhaps in Binghamton, having courses, financial literacy mm -hmm. courses that are maybe perhaps required? You know, yeah, yeah and, and I think those things are important. Oftentimes that will come from the financial aid and student records area. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I know you're going to speak with um, the director of financial aid and student records mm -hmm. in the future. It's more driven through, through their area. Financial literacy is a big financial aid topic because it's not just about the aid and the scholarships, it's also about being literal. And we can partner with them on that. And mm -hmm. there are campuses across the country that make you go through a financial aid literacy um, online program before you even start. Mm -hmm. There's there's students that are required to take a financial literacy course before. I'm not sure, again, I came in August, so yeah, yeah. I'm still kind of getting used to what we do here, but, um, but I, do, I do think that's something that we need to move towards. And, and one of the things that Dennis and I are doing together is we're starting to work together towards mm -hmm. getting some common things that we can do to help students. And, and you know, in seven months into it, I've found some things that that is something that definitely is on our priority list of how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate more? Is there any particular ideas that you could discuss or any aspirations you and Dennis want to do? Yeah, we haven't really gotten to that level yet. I think we understand that that needs to be done. SUNY has also come out with mm -hmm. a lot of things that, 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 that students are going through. So there's um, different um, pages that, that they can look at when they're applying for their application. Um, campuses are required to put their information there, how much it's going to cost, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of where that's going, again, it's going to be driven more by the enrollment management team. I'm not, I'm not, I don't report through that, that area, so that's more really there. So, you know, we've, we've talked about things we need to do, but again, not even being here a year, I think um, there's nothing concrete that I can share with you at this okay. point. Now, uh, one of the things I love about Binghamton is the diversity. You have a lot of people from straight from China, yeah. India, yeah. Um, and all over the, the world, basically. Right. And what I found interesting is that they pay the same rate as somebody from New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Um, so for our international audience, what are some important things they need to know, or even for our state people? Yeah. Well, I think it's important to understand there is a tra t tuition differential. There's mm -hmm. a difference in the tuition price. Um, and that's because, again, it's a New York State agency and we're funded through taxpayers' dollars. Um, because the cost is that much more, looking into different types of scholarships or funding, if they need it, is important also. Um, and the other part of that is um, if they truly would like to be a, a New York State resident and they want to establish residence here and live here, there's, there's things that are required in order to have that tuition rate change. Um, if you grew up in New Jersey and you come to school here and it's not that far away and you spend your summer here, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily a New York State resident paying taxes and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and get that rate. And so, because it's a lot, it's a big difference. And I think if you look at the rate sheets on our website, you'll see that it's a big difference. Um, I think for international students, something that's real important is, um, you know, just making sure you've got your housing set up and, and those kind of things. Because a lot of students don't live on campus, they live off campus. Understanding how refunding works because, you know, it might be, you might be taking a loan or parent loan or a student may also be, um, have an outside scholarship or something that comes in and they need that refund in order to pay their rent. And so to understand the differences of when those things come out, that we need to have those funds before we can give them to and those kind of things. So, um, but I mean, in reality, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why there's a different rate for tuition because mm -hmm. yeah. of the funding process of mm -hmm. how we are funded. So, and that's, and I think most, most mm -hmm. international and, um, and 
out of state students understand that. They know what they're they know what they're gonna end up paying. Okay. Now, so. interesting. Now, on the you're very familiar with the state level in terms of New York State, mm -hmm. um, and also a lot of funding comes from federal. Um, do you have any um, opinions or any suggestions in terms of you know this a uh, you know political year and in terms of um, federally financing education? Is there anything you would like to see personally? Well, one of the things that had happened was the Perkins loan program had gone away. Actually, it sun it went through sunset and the. Um, the Congress had brought it back, and that was a very good thing. I would suggest that with the cost of higher education going up all the time, that the federal government is not upping the loan amount that what you can borrow. I mean, a lot of students don't want to take loans, but they don't have a choice. That's the only way they're going to get through. So I would suggest in, that if if Congress could look at that, I mean, there's a talk about making community college free. There's a lot of things that are out there, but ultimately, um, higher education is expensive. There are private schools that charge sixty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, it's crazy. And yeah. and how do students afford those kind of things? And how does that work? And and why is why is higher education so expensive? So those are the kind of things that pop into my mind. Mm -hmm. But but in terms of a New York State's a pretty pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. If you're a New York State resident and you go to school, I mean, think about your education here and what you're yeah. getting. Yeah. And 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 the university center that you're going to and what you're really paying in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah. It's you know, very reasonable. Yeah, if I could go back in time, one of the things I would have done is in my high school they offered community mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. Instead, I took AP classes, but um, a lot, all of my community, you know, credits transferred here. Right. So um, perhaps a smarter option is, of course, maybe do community college. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of transfers. We do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of students that take that route. Route. They'll go to a community college for two years and then and then transfer. Um, sometimes it's a bigger jump in terms of getting used to the academic mm -hmm. requirements and rigorousness of what yeah. you do. Sometimes it's not, it depends, but financially it's a fantastic way to do it. Think about the difference in what you'd pay. Very true. So, and also taking, we have a lot of freshmen that come in and they're like sophomore status already oh, in terms right. of their credit hours, mm -hmm. but then again they also have to take the classes they need mm -hmm. in their majors, so those might not have transferred in, but they're yeah. registering. Before yeah. They're not registering as in the freshman slots because of the credit hours that they have and they transferred in. So taking classes in high school is a great is a good way to do that too. And sometimes you can get out in three years instead of four. And yeah. there you go, you save yeah. money yeah. that way. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's again taking the twelve to fifteen credits a semester and mm -hmm. transferring credits in. So depending on, on what on what, what you want out of your college experience. Yeah. Some people want to be here for four years because they want to be able to be a student for four years. Very true, yeah. <laughs> Instead of going to work, yeah, <laughs> like true. I do every day. <laughs> so yeah, I, it seems like you know planning is definitely a, a, a major point in, a, in our conversation. Definitely. And uh, preparing yeah. and you know seeing your future out and sometimes you know uh, procrastination is mm -hmm. a big issue with students. Mm -hmm. So definitely you know students they should be more aware their options and yeah. other courses and more in control. Yeah, and, and especially especially if you're really not sure what you want to do. I mean some some students come in and they know exactly what they're gonna do, they know the major. And and even those students all of a sudden say, Oh my goodness, I don't want to do that. I mean, you know, out the Binghamton University encourages students to explore. They don't you don't have to declare a major as soon as you get here, those kind of things. And and understanding that it's important though that 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 you realize that it could take more, more than four years to graduate then too, mm -hmm. which is another, it, that's more of a financial expense. Very true. So, okay. so um, what makes Binghamton University in particular very exceptional in your opinion? Well, one of the things I think is very exceptional about Binghamton is its retention rate. 90% mm -hmm. of the students um, are retained here and that's, that's a tremendous um, statistic compared to the other schools in, in, the, in the nation. Um, and I think the reason why that happens is because our people are exceptional. Our students, our faculty, our staff, um, the community supports the students here. Um, sometimes at a big university, people feel they get the runaround and they're passed around a little bit, and and and, and it, it's hard to kind of manage through some things. But ultimately, the people here really want the students to succeed. Um, and as a student, do you feel that way? Yeah, um, definitely. This is a research institution. Yes, it is. So you know, sometimes we take professors for granted, mm -hmm. but you know, a lot of times they're top of their field. And a lot of times, whether it's in chemistry, mm -hmm. I know we had a Nobel um, chemist in Binghamton yes. that was nominated. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of people in philosophy department. I'm a PPL and econ major. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Binghamton is diverse, and again, the diversity really helps. It does, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that I find the university has a, has a really great strategic plan and vision. Um, 
I'm so excited about the pharmacy school opening, and I see that happening. I think you know the whole 2020 yeah. thing to get 20,000 students here by 2020. I, it's exciting to work here. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's support for faculty and staff and students because of, of the programs they're looking at, and things they want to do, and and they're and and I find in my role management meetings and my academic council meetings. Um, the people here are always looking to, to forward instead of where they are or backwards. Mm -hmm. So the vision here is, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the last thing I think is the facilities. Uh, um, for a state institution, this is a state agency. Mm -hmm. we, our grounds are beautiful, our buildings, I mean the, the amount of, of energy, time, and money that's been put into this campus um, is pretty tremendous. The marketplace was a wonderful addition. You know, that, that, um, that partnership with Sodexo has been great. Um, all the new residence halls that are up, and, mm -hmm. and the things that are, and, and I think you know they're going to be bringing up the, um, the, I think where you live yeah. now is there. They're that they're, they're slated to be redoing those. They're, they're putting, they're putting, um, resources into their physical plant. Yeah. And a lot of times that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. So so there's been a lot of good things about mm -hmm. about. The, even the facilities that I find, it, you know, are the building that we're in now mm -hmm. was a renovation and a one-stop shop. So they're being thoughtful about how they're doing those kind of things too, yeah, which is important. True. Yeah, I think Binghamton is sort of um, the heartbeat, Binghamton University of Binghamton in yes. Endicott area. Yeah. Um, and one of the, through talking to people, a lot of the concerns is that the, out, the outer area definitely needs some improvement. Mm -hmm. So hopefully the energy of Binghamton can spread out. And I do think you're right, you know, yeah. with the pharmacy. That's, oh, Johnson City is thrilled about that. Yeah. Coming. Definitely will definitely uplift the whole neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you, Binghamton itself, do you like the community, the area? Oh, yeah, yeah. I live in Vestal, and mm -hmm. it's just, it's, um, there's a lot of shopping here. Like I told you, I was from the North Country, so <laughs> yeah. I enjoy that. I mean, people from, I grew up on Long Island, so of course, mm -hmm. people from Long Island will think it's a little tiny town compared to what they're used to, but mm -hmm. um, people are genuinely very nice here. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, people um, are, are, are considerate, um, friendly. And that's important to me, especially on campus students. I notice sometimes I, I lived on campus for a um, couple of months before I found my housing because I came in on the first day of classes. And one of the things I found when I walked to work in the morning, that the student body is very intense here. They're zoned in and doing their thing. And at 8 o'clock in the morning when I'm walking to work, they're tired. <laughs> yeah. But I noticed in the afternoons yeah. that, you know, there's a little bit more. There's uh, And just walking through the... Hinman and seeing everybody playing mm -hmm. tag football and all that. I mean, yeah. it's a, there's a nice sense of community here, and I think yeah. that there's there's a balance, there's a balance, mm -hmm. which is good, because sometimes when you get to a research or a university center, mm -hmm. it's it's all work and no play, and I yeah. think you need a little bit of that. So, but but I do also think that the when IBM left, and um, that was very difficult for this area when the, when the plants closed, and 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 the university is the is the heartbeat of, of mm -hmm. this area. Yeah. You know, think about it. There's 17,000 students approximately here, oh, wow. yeah, that yeah, with so. all of the programs. And when the pharmacy school comes in, that'll make that bigger. And mm -hmm. think about the employment, 4,000 yeah. faculty and staff, and mm -hmm. it makes a big difference. So. That is very true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the hills are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not looking up them, but <laughs> sometimes it's foggy in the morning. I'm getting used to that. Yeah, the, the temperature fluctuates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although it's not like uh, was it uh, for for Paxton, Paxton, yeah. where oh yes, yeah, it's yeah. about 50 degrees colder today than it is here. Yeah. So yeah, they're getting rain and snow. Yeah. So. No, but Kipsi is like 10 degrees warmer. Right, so, right, yeah. 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 Well, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, All right. yeah. All right. Well, thank you for thank joining you, me, Brian. It was wonderful yeah. to see you. You too. All right. See you. Bye. <laughs>